It was early in the morning, on a Wednesday morning, when I got on the number 33 bus to go to the Royal Edinburgh Infirmary to check myself in for a psychiatric evaluation. When I got to the emergency room, it was completely packed. So I got in a queue, and when I got up to the intake person, I said, hi, I'm an American, and I'm here with the festival, and I think I might be losing my mind. <laughs> Now, either they get a lot of this sort of thing, or they had never seen anything like this because she didn't ask me a single question. She just said, it's going to be a long wait. <laughs> so I sat down, and I felt really alone. I had come to Scotland two weeks earlier after accepting an offer to perform a one-person play that I had written at the Edinburgh International Theatre Festival. And I was sure that this was going to be the start of a European tour. I had arrived with high hopes, and things hadn't gone exactly like I had expected. The apartment that the producers had arranged for me had undependable plumbing, the bed was missing a mattress, so I was tossing and turning all night on a bare box spring. And the theater that my play was booked into, it was on this tiny side street with poor signage, and it was miles away from all the popular festival venues, which ensured that there would be zero foot traffic. On top of that, my play was being produced, and it was sandwiched in between larger productions which meant that I had curtain times that were also guaranteed to bring in throngs of people. The times were like 11.21 a.m. <laughs> or 6.17 in the evening. The day before my excursion to the hospital, exactly four people had shown up for the 3.32 performance. <laughs> 15 minutes into the show, there were two people left in the audience. You know, it's really hard to laugh at a comedy when you're in an empty theater unless you're really stoned. <laughs> so I stopped the play and I said, listen guys, you want to go out for a drink, <laughs> a cup of coffee, tea, my treat. And they said, no, we're really loving this. And I noticed that the woman in the couple was extraordinarily pregnant. So I thought, maybe she really can't stand up. I better keep doing the show. So I continued the show. And afterwards, we hugged each other. And then the stage manager came up to me. She was a very young, very enthusiastic gal. And she said, well, I think that show went great. And I just want you to know, I don't think the audience could tell, but I could see the tears rolling down your cheeks. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, the audience, all two of them, <laughs> inches as they were in front of me, yeah, pretty sure they noticed that I had been weeping throughout the show. So I, I wandered around the streets of Edinburgh that night, and there may have been some drinking involved. <laughs> Is this what I crossed the Atlantic for? See, I had wanted to be an actress for as long as I could remember. And growing up Jewish in Miami Beach, I had started out with the Temple Beth Shalom players. <laughs> now, Beth Shalom in the 1970s was a reformed congregation. It was the kind of place where there was always someone strumming guitar in the service, singing, blowing in the wind. I actually grew up thinking blowing in the wind was part of the Bible. <laughs> now, of course, we were very culturally minded at Beth Shalom, so we did plays. And in fact, we did all of the important plays drawn from the vast American theater canon. Everything from Fiddler on the Roof all the way to Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. <laughs> My very favorite production was a Jerry Herman musical, Milk and Honey. In this show, 
all five of us girls, average age 14, played middle-aged housewives from the Midwest who were widowed or divorced, and we had all gone to Israel in search of a husband, and we would presumably stay there for the rest of our lives. Now, this show doesn't make a lick of sense when you really think about it, because it would have meant schlepping suitcases across the Sinai, but no matter. By the time I was 18, I was ready to step it up, and so I flew to New York to check out drama schools, and I was checking out NYU when I got an invitation to see a student production at the Experimental Theater Wing of NYU. I arrived that night, and the play was being done in a room with no set, the two actors weren't wearing costumes, they were in their street clothes. They were speaking at the same time, we never did that at Beth Shalom. They were cursing, we didn't do that at Beth Shalom. And in the middle of a show, they had a pizza delivered. Yeah, a real pizza delivery guy showed up, the cast collected money, and we all had slices. I, I had no idea what was going on, I didn't know what the hell they were doing, but I knew this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> it was one of those eureka moments when everything becomes clear and you have this clarity of purpose. And see, in my experience, those eureka moments, they're not, you know, like that saying goes, you know, it's not a destination, it's the journey that counts. But for me, that's often the case. This eureka is like a flashlight that illuminates a path to follow. And the thing about eureka is that there's no guarantee of what the outcome will be or what that eureka might ask of you. So when I began studying theater at NYU, I began studying this theater aesthetic that was pioneered by French surrealist playwright Antonin Artaud in the 1920s. Artaud posited in his seminal work, The Theater of Cruelty, that Western theater had fallen into a kind of lassitude and it needed a lacerating wake-up call. Now, as it turns out, not everyone goes to the theater for a lashing assault on the senses. <laughs> and Artaud ended his days in a straitjacket in a mental institution. But he remains an important figure in the theater world. And I was studying with one of the avatars of the modern experimental theater movement, Richard Schechner. Now, Richard drew his influences even further back than Artaud, even further back than the Greeks who had developed the notion of theater as catharsis back to the ancient world. Now, you have to imagine, the ancient world was a terrifying place, right? There would be a storm or a drought, you catch a cold, that could be a punishment from the gods, who knows, right? So, tribes developed ritualized forms of play to create a poetic world alongside the natural world. And in this way, they were transported into liminal states, time out of time. And participating in this sacred suspension of time, it contributed to the cohesiveness of the community. Anthropologists tell us that when you participate in these synchronous activities, like a ritual, like singing together, or dancing together, or praying together, even deep breathing together, well, that leads to what they call collective effervescence. And that's the breaking down of the boundaries between self and group. Now, when I heard that this was our goal, I mean, I was really in, because, you know, I had always liked the way that casts bonded together at Beth Shalom, but this idea that theater itself could be used as community building, well, that really spoke to me, because I had all that exposure to that blowing in the wind kind of ethos at Beth Shalom. And that's how I spent the next few years of my life. But then, 
when I began to get work in television and film and start a family, I really left that world behind. But in the recent years, I have felt a loss, a real sense of loss for that collective effervescence experience. And I don't think that this is an accident, that it happened at the same time as the internet promised us increased connectivity, because it delivered, right? I can be connected now to people across, across the globe, but the only thing is I'm connecting to them while I'm at home alone, isolated in front of my computer which makes me feel more isolated and lonely. So I felt the need to return every chance I get to experiences where we can have these shared liminal experiences, like today. But at that moment, in that emergency room in Scotland, I really thought that I had hit rock bottom. Is this how it started with our toe? <laughs> <laughs> and then I had one of those eureka moments. I saw a direct line between pizza delivery guy and the emergency room in Scotland. And that's the thing about that eureka. It can really return you to who you are and what you believe in. Now, sometimes when you have one of those eureka, aha moments and you want to listen to that voice, well, you might not want to do that. I mean, if a eureka voice is telling you to break the law or even break the golden rule, that might not be a eureka you want to listen to. So I come up with kind of a eureka criteria. If my eureka is in the service of building a bridge between my experience and your experience. Well, that's how we create empathy. So that's a eureka I'll listen to. That's my eureka gold standard. So, I thought about what it was that I had to do and I thought about how, sure, it's much more fun when there are a thousand people gathered together. But I thought about how those two people at that show the day before, well, I felt I had really connected with them. I mean, I've had some sex that was less intimate than that show. <laughs> and I thought, there's only one place in the entire country of Scotland where there are people who might be hoping to connect to me. So I got back on the number 33 bus. I headed back to town. I found a hotel with a really good bed. I took a long, hot shower, and I headed over to the theater for the 517 performance. <laughs> Thank you.